Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to this very special public lecture and performance. My name is Sam Howison, and it's my pleasure simply to introduce it. I start with uh, the usual housekeeping, which is to say, if there is, by any misfortune, a fire alarm, it will be a genuine one. Uh, and in that case, please leave by the emergency exits, which are indicated by the green men over the door there and the two doors at the back. This is a very interesting one, which takes you down and into the car park. But I hope you don't have to use it. Secondly, um, I'd like to start, uh, I'd like to thank the sponsors of these events. Whether you're a regular attender or not, you'll know that we have a very high quality sequence of public lectures, and that's thanks to the generous generosity of XTX Markets, uh, who are a global financial firm with offices in uh, London and Singapore and New York, who kindly sponsor these events. So, to move on to the topic of this evening's discussion, it's um, often said that mathematicians and music go together. Now, <coughs> when you think of the mathematicians you know, raging emotion and high passion, maybe not. But then you think, <laughs> well, maybe we're still waters run deep, you know. But uh, then when you think about other things like the search for structure and pattern and the way in which the tiniest detail articulates into the, the bigger picture, then you begin to see that there are indeed very many connections between mathematics and music, and that's what we're going to be exploring tonight. And we're going to be doing it in the context of someone who many people would say is the mathematician's composer, namely Johann Sebastian Bach. And our uh, presentation this evening is what you might call a two-part invention. The first part, the subject, if you like, is going to be a talk by James Sparks. Now, James is uh, one of our own mathematicians on the faculty here. He is, uh, I thought, probably uniquely qualified to give a talk like this because he, uh, in his career, was an organ scholar at Selwyn College in Cambridge and uh, learned to play that instrument to a very high standard, which he is now transferring to the piano. And in his day job, he is a string theorist, which I suppose is <laughs> appropriate, isn't it? <laughs> he did his PhD with Stephen Hawking and uh, now worked in mathematical physics here. And then the, uh, the counter subject, as it were, will be uh, the performance we see here, the City of London Symphonia. Uh, I don't think I really need to tell you how well known they are. They have been one of Britain's top orchestras for a very long time. They're uh, famous for taking music into interesting places and doing interesting things. And indeed, this evening's performance is just the first of uh, a tour that is taking Bach and the Cosmos around the country. So the uh, City of London Symphonia was founded by uh, uh, Richard, I couldn't remember the Christian name, Richard, Richard Hiscox in uh, 1971 and is led by Alexandra Wood tonight. So that, those are our performers and there will be a talk first. There will then be a very short gap for tuning and so on, during which please don't uh, leave the room because uh, we'll move straight on to the performance of the Goldberg Variations straight after. So, I will now hand over to James, who is going to talk about Bach and the Cosmos. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Sam, for that introduction. So, I am a mathematician and theoretical physicist working here in the Maths Institute. But as Sam mentioned, I'm also an amateur musician. As someone who was drawn to maths and music from quite an early age, the connections between the two have always fascinated me. In fact, people will often say that maths and music go together. But why is that? I'd like to begin by talking about what I think are some of the connections. So at a fundamental level, the <laughs> elements of music are governed by mathematics. For example, take harmony. The reason that certain combinations of notes sound harmonious together 
is because of the mathematical relationship between the frequencies or pitches of those notes. In fact, much of the structure of musical tuning, keys, chords and the other elements of harmony can all be understood and to a certain extent even be explained mathematically. I could spend a whole lecture just expanding on that one topic. There are other mathematical aspects of music too. So the subdivision of music into bars and beats, different rhythms, and also the different permutations and combinations of all of those elements. Composers also make use of patterns and symmetry when writing music, as I'll discuss a bit later. All of this gives music an abstract and logical structure. In fact, just like mathematics, there's even a special notation that's used to describe that structure. Learning both of these, it's much like learning a language. And once you begin to learn, you also start to develop some intuition in these abstract worlds of maths and music. I think that's part of what draws people to both at that very young age. It's probably also got something to do with why child prodigies tend to be mathematicians or musicians. Of course, sometimes even both. But I also think there are some other, perhaps less obvious connections. Um, in particular, although music and especially maths are abstract, logical, constrained, there is nevertheless an enormous freedom for creativity in both, with an important role played by both symmetry and beauty. To explain more what I mean by that, we first of all have to look a little bit more closely at mathematics. That is, what mathematics is and what do mathematicians actually do? Well, the first thing to say is there are different types of mathematician. For example, some study the applications of maths to other areas, such as engineering, finance, uh, biology, and so on. But there are also mathematicians who study the very foundations of mathematics itself, and they're really studying abstract structures and the relationships between those structures. Even if you have very little idea of what these types of mathematicians actually do on a day-to-day -day basis, you'll probably say it's got something to do with equations. So an equation, such as a equals b here, is of course a statement of a relationship saying that a and b are equivalent in whatever sense is intended in that equation. It's actually very easy to start writing down true equations. For example, if I know that a equals b, then I can deduce that a plus 1 equals b plus 1. Or another true equation is 2 times a equals 2 times b. But of course, mathematicians don't just generate true equations in some mechanical way like this, just as composers don't just generate sequences of notes. Mathematicians, especially those studying the foundations of the subject, they seek interesting, elegant, and beautiful equations and mathematical structures. An equation is interesting if it's not obvious that the two sides are equal to each other, or much more importantly, it's not obvious why they're equal to each other. So while a equals b might be an interesting equation, we could probably agree that 2 times a equals 2 times b isn't a very interesting consequence of it. Similarly, the proof of an equation might be described as elegant if it distills the underlying reason for that relationship down to its simplest and purest form. The 19th century French mathematician Henri Poincaré said, the mathematician does not study pure mathematics because it's useful. They study it because they delight in it, and they delight in it because it's beautiful. And in fact, you can find this inscription here outside the entrance to the Mathematical Institute. Some of you will have walked over the top of that on your way in. It says to freedom, and a pursuit of beauty in mathematics. This notion of beauty in mathematics, it's quite hard to make precise and define in general, just as it is when applied to, say, art or music. But I think at least in part, mathematical beauty has often got something to do with finding simplicity and complexity at the same time. Now, by simple here, of course, I don't mean trivial, but rather something natural and elegant. And the complexity is often hidden. It's there to be uncovered by the mathematician. 
To try to give an example of that, let's briefly talk about group theory, which is the study of symmetry in mathematics. The definition or axioms of group theory are extremely simple and very natural. But despite that simplicity, it took hundreds of mathematicians more than a century to understand and classify the basic building blocks of those structures. And moreover, they include some extraordinarily complicated mathematical objects. To paraphrase the mathematician Richard Borchards, who worked in exactly that area, there's no obvious hint that anything like that level of complexity exists hidden in that original very simple, very natural definition. This is the sort of thing that mathematicians find beautiful. There's a sense that such <coughs> mathematical structures are perfect. They just exist isolated and independent from the clutter of the rest of the world around us. Although, of course, it also takes a mathematician to uncover that. Mathematicians also like to enumerate things. We like to classify things. And we like to systematically work through all possibilities. And in fact, these are all traits that we'll see later in the music of Johann Sebastian Bach, who is often considered to be a mathematical composer. So more on that shortly. Now, in mathematics, creativity also plays a very important role. I think this is something that isn't generally appreciated by non-mathematicians. Finding new links between different areas, coming up with new methods of proof, defining new types of mathematics, and so on. They all require a lot of creative input and imagination. Also, the way that mathematicians create, especially in the early stages of an idea, is often very intuitive and non-linear, with more linear and methodical reasoning usually coming in a bit later. And I think in music that composers often work in much the same way, and I think they do so for similar reasons. So I think in both maths and in music, one is simultaneously trying to create, but also discover interesting and beautiful structures in a constrained and abstract system. Once you begin to create those constraints of mathematical logic or musical harmony, they inevitably lead to many consequences. Now, sometimes you're lucky and those are wonderful consequences, but more often than not, you don't get what you're looking for and you need to use intuition to guide that simultaneous process of creation and exploration. So I think a lot of that is summed up really beautifully by the following quote by the 20th century British mathematician and philosopher Bertrand Russell. Uh, Russell said, it seems to me now that mathematics is capable of an artistic excellence as great as that of any music perhaps greater, not because the pleasure it gives is comparable, either in the intensity or in the number of people who feel it to that of music, but because it gives in absolute perfection that combination characteristic of great art, of godlike freedom with the sense of inevitable destiny. Because in fact, it constructs an ideal world where everything is perfect, but true. So I think there is a sense in which mathematicians have godlike freedom. We can create all manner of abstract worlds just with a pen and paper. But at the same time, because of those logical constraints of maths, there is also this sense of inevitable destiny, just like in group theory, where that very simple and natural starting point, from there it just inevitably leads to all of this rich and intricate structure. I'll come back to this quote again a bit later, because although here Russell is talking about mathematics as compared to music, I think parts of this also really beautifully describe the music of Bach. Russell also touches on an important difference between maths and music here. Music can invoke a range of emotional responses that, on the whole, are absent in mathematics. In fact, I'm sure this is what draws so many mathematically minded people like me to music. We're naturally attracted to the abstract, logical nature of music with its use of patterns and symmetry and so on. But at the same time, there's also a strong emotional connection. Although that's not to say that mathematicians don't derive pleasure and joy from doing mathematics. 
Now, for some mathematicians, these links uh, between the creative processes in maths uh, and music extend even further still. So I'll come down here so I can read it properly. Um, so this was particularly true of Albert Einstein here. So remarkably, he said the following about uh, relativity, which is his geometric theory of space, time, and gravity. He said, the theory of relativity occurred to me by intuition, and music is the driving force behind that intuition. My parents had me study the violin from the time I was six. My new discovery is the result of musical perception. That's a truly astonishing thing to have said, and I would love to have been able to ask him more about what he meant exactly. Moreover, his wife Elsa once remarked that music helps him when he's thinking about his theories. He goes to his study, comes back, strikes a few chords on the piano, jots something down, and then returns to his study. Now, I must admit, I do something quite similar whenever I'm working from home. And before I read this quote, which was actually really recently, I'd always thought it was just procrastination. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but maybe there is something deeper going on. I, so I think the aesthetics one is looking for in maths and in theoretical physics, they're common also to music. In particular, I think Einstein here at his piano, I think he was looking for simplicity, harmony, and beauty in his ideas, and clearly for him, music was the inspiration for that. Now, this combination of simplicity, complexity, symmetry, and beauty in music, I think reaches its pinnacle with the works of Johann Sebastian Bach. Bach here was a church musician and organist, and I started playing his music from around the age of 11, which is when I took up playing the organ. As already mentioned, Bach is often considered to be a mathematical composer. And my interest in his music and also his style of composition definitely coincided with my interest in maths at school. But why is that? And in what sense is in Bach's music particularly mathematical? Um, well, before getting into the details of this, I should of course say I don't mean to imply that Bach's music can somehow be reduced to mathematics, because that obviously is not the case. But I do believe that the kinds of intricate structures that he weaves into his music, they do add to its beauty, and are what give his music that particular sense of being perfect, but true, to paraphrase that quote from Bertrand Russell earlier. Well, much of Bach's music makes use of counterpoint where two or more melodies are woven together into a single piece of music. A key feature of counterpoint is that although these melodies are independent, each functioning as music in their own right, they should also complement each other. So for example, if one melody has a rapid pattern of notes, perhaps another melody is slow moving. And after a while, they might then swap over those two behaviors, perhaps in some kind of dialogue. Similarly, if one melody is moving upwards in pitch, perhaps another melody is moving downwards in pitch. So musical counterpoint should be balanced in this way, much like balancing your two sides of an equation. Another important feature of counterpoint, especially in Bach's music, is the use of repeated patterns of notes and symmetry. Now, mathematicians spend a lot of their time looking for patterns and symmetry in abstract mathematical structures, when trying to understand those structures. I think what makes Bach here particularly unique as a composer is the extent to which he builds symmetry and structure into his music, but also the very mathematical way in which he approaches that. So to try to illustrate this, I've here depicted the first three bars of variation three of the Goldberg variations that we're gonna hear in full later. For the moment, I'm only showing the first violin part. So the vertical dotted lines here, they denote bar lines, with the time increasing as you move from left to right across the picture. So for example, this is bar one here, this is bar two in the middle, and this is bar three. 
I've also denoted the pitch or the frequency of the notes by height vertically in the picture. So uh, this melody here, it starts on a long held note followed by a rising pattern of short notes. That takes us to halfway through the first bar and in the second half of the bar, Bach repeats the first half of the bar, just translated one note lower in pitch. That already gives us some symmetry between the two halves of that first bar. Well, let's now hear the first violin play these first three bars. And obviously the musical phrase carries on after that. Now to make counterpoint, Bach needs to add at least one more melody to this. But what melody is he going to use? Well, why not an exact copy of this melody? Obviously if those play at the same time, then they'll just sound as one. So instead, Bach takes a copy of this first melody and then he translates it in time to obtain a second melody that I've here shown in blue. This is called a canon in music, or more colloquially we'd call it a round, and variation three of the Goldberg variations is a canon. The first melody is played by the first violin, with its identical blue copy there played by the second violin. entire variation carries on in that way with the second melody being an exact copy of the first melody just shifted one bar later. In addition Bach adds a third and final melody to these two played by the cello and double bass. So let's now hear the first eight bars of this variation now with all three of the melodies playing together. Let's think a little bit more carefully about the process of actually composing a canon like this. So if you just take any melody and you translate it in time to obtain a second melody, they are almost certainly not going to fit together. Okay, so the notes will clash, there won't be any sense of balance, the melodies won't complement each other, and so on. Imagine though that you've only written the first bar of this melody. That takes us to the start of bar two, and that's where its blue copy here begins playing. But of course that music's then already been written. So what you write in the first bar is very much going to constrain what you can write in the second bar, and that constrains what you can write in the third bar, and so on. Now if you've ever s tried composing music like this, and I spent a lot of my teenage years doing exactly that, you'll find that it is much like solving a mathematical problem. The musical line has to fit with itself, sometimes in multiple ways. Now, of course, there's not usually a unique solution to that, but there is sometimes, musically, a best solution. After writing the first bar, the music can sometimes almost seem to write itself, although it takes a lot of work to uncover precisely how. I think this type of composition is probably the closest we get to that mathematical creative process I was describing earlier, it definitely has a sense of inevitable destiny. Now, when repeating a melody to make a canon, we don't have to repeat it at the same pitch. The copy can be translated in pitch as well as translated in time. And this is an example of that. It's variation six of the Goldberg variations. 
so I've again depicted the first melody in black. Um, this time that's played by the violas, with its blue copy played by the violins. In this instance, that blue copy, it again begins one bar later, but it's also one note higher. And you can probably both see and hear that there's repetition going on within the melody again too. In fact, it's that that gave it a sense that the violins and violas were chasing each other. So let's hear the first 16 bars now of this variation, again with a cello part added as a third melody. So we've now seen translation in time and translation in pitch used to build a musical structure. What other musical maps like this might we apply to a melody when composing music? Well, I could take a pattern of notes, for example this one, and invert it. So that means rather than going one note down, in my blue copy go to here I go one note up. Rather than going four notes up there in my blue copy, I go four notes down. Now, when you represent music as I've done graphically here, this inversion map corresponds to a reflection in a horizontal axis. To make a canon, I should then take my blue copy there and translate it in time, so move it to the right. And in fact, these are the first three bars of variation 12 of the Goldberg variations, which is a canon by inversion, in which the starting note of these two melodies here also differs by three notes. Writing any music that's this mathematically constrained is technically very difficult, let alone music as beautiful as these Goldberg variations are. Now, these canons are quite extreme examples, but the key point here is that Bach uses musical maps like this in his compositions all the time. It's just usually at smaller scales. So that is, he'll use repeated patterns of notes where there's a very particular design and mathematical structure to that repetition. Bach will often start with a small, simple, elegant musical idea, and in this way, he'll systematically build up a large and complex musical work from it. I think it's this in particular that gives Bach's music that sense of mathematical beauty. So I'd like to move on and briefly discuss the global structure of these Goldberg variations that we're uh, soon to hear in full. So the Goldberg variations consist of an aria followed by 30 variations with the aria again repeated <coughs> at the very end. Let's now hear the first eight bars of this beautiful aria. Now, unlike a usual theme and variations, here it's not the melody of that aria that's then going to be reworked in the subsequent variations. Rather, it's the harmony and it's the bass line that's played by the cello. That's the constant theme that's running throughout the entire piece of music. 
These subsequent 30 variations then have a very particular structure. So the first two variations and the very last variation, they don't quite fit the pattern. But that leaves 27 variations in the middle, and they're very specifically grouped into nine lots of three. So the first variation in a group of three is always a canon, some of which we've heard parts of already. The second variation in a group of three is always a piece of music in a particular musical style. So, for example, there are a number of different types of Baroque dances. Um, there's a fugue, and there's even an overture, which is exactly halfway through the 30 variations, starting the second half of the piece. The third variation in a group of three are the ones that are most difficult to play in Bach's original arrangement of the Goldberg variations for the keyboard. So they're fast, with two melodies, one melody assigned to each hand, and those melodies cross over each other, which means when you play them on the piano keyboard that your hands cross over each other on the piano keyboard. I think in these variations, Bach works through every conceivable way you can cross and uncross and tangle, if you're me, your hands on a keyboard. Most interesting, though, I think, is the structure of these canons. And it's here in particular that we can see another of Bach's mathematical traits. Bach, like a mathematician, liked to enumerate things, and he liked to systematically work through all possibilities. When a mathematician needs a new equation or mathematical structure, one of the first things they'll do is ask how many solutions there are. Maybe there are none. But if there's at least one, can they be enumerated or classified? Is there a way to systematically work through or generate all of the possibilities? These are all natural things that mathematicians will ask. But if we look at the structure of these canons, we can actually see Bach thinking in a very similar mathematical mindset. So, for example, the first canon is variation <coughs> three, and it has the two melodies of the canon beginning on the same note. The second canon is variation six, and has the two melodies of the canon beginning one note apart. So we heard parts of both of those earlier. But actually that pattern continues throughout all nine of these canons. For the mathematicians amongst you, the nth canon is variation 3n and has the two melodies of the canon beginning on n minus one notes apart, and n there runs from one through to nine. Um, but that's not all. So there are nine of these canons, and Bach very clearly knew that nine was three times three. And so in these canons, Bach works through the three times three ways that you can subdivide a bar into two beats in a bar, three beats in a bar, and four beats in a bar, but at the same time, subdivide each of those beats into two notes, three notes, and four notes, respectively, as you can see in the table. A simpler way to say it is that in these nine canons, Bach is working through nine different time signatures. If that weren't enough, in the last row of this table, Bach is working through yet another set of combinations. So canon four here is a canon by inversion. We looked at that very briefly earlier. Canon seven here is one of three of these Goldberg variations, which is in the key of G minor, rather than the G major key of the aria, and the other 27 variations. That's yet another occurrence of the number three in these Goldberg variations, of which there are many. And finally, canon five here, it's both in G minor and it's a canon by inversion. This fifth canon is variation 15, and it ends the first half of the Goldberg variations before you hear the overture that I mentioned earlier. Well, there are many other structures in these canons and Goldberg variations that I could also talk about, and indeed throughout much of Bach's other music. The way that Bach builds symmetry and structure into his music, both in different ways but also at different scales of the composition, give it this sense of ordered architecture. Bach will often systematically work through different permutations and combinations, much like a mathematician might, making repeated use of patterns and symmetry. And it's in this way that he can build up these very large and complex musical works, sometimes just starting from a very small fragment 
of a musical theme or idea. This idea of starting with something small and simple and then systematically creating and discovering a very large structure from it is very appealing to mathematicians. It's elegant and it's beautiful. I think this must have inspired Einstein too, who was a great admirer of Bach's music. In fact, we know that Einstein did play a lot of Bach's music. Einstein, after all, was trying to understand the structure of the entire universe using a small number of elegant ideas. Bach's genius meant that he was able to use this kind of approach to write beautiful music that's also got a more abstract mathematical beauty. And for me, it's that combination that makes his music so special. Well, I'd like to end with this memorable quote by the author Douglas Adams that inspired the title of this concert series. Uh, Douglas Adams said, Beethoven tells you what it's like to be Beethoven, and Mozart tells you what it's like to be human. Bach tells you what it's like to be the universe. <coughs> now, the cosmos, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, is the world or universe viewed as an ordered and harmonious system. Hopefully, after my talk today, and especially after you've heard, heard these wonderful Goldberg variations, you'll agree with Douglas Adams. Bach does tell you what it's like to be the cosmos. And you know, I think maybe even Einstein would have agreed with that too. Thank you.